welcome to Ipsa Dixit, a podcast on legal scholarship. I'm your host, Brian L. Fry, Spears Gilbert Associate Professor of Law at the University of Kentucky College of Law. My guest is Caroline Seacott, Assistant Professor of Law at Antonin Scalia Law School at George Mason University. We will discuss her article, Transparency in Agency Cost-Benefit Analysis, which she co-authored with Robert Hahn and which will be published in the Administrative Law Review. So welcome to the show, Caroline. Hello, Brian. I'm thrilled to be here. <laughs> so I, 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 for the benefit of listeners, especially our Polish listeners, <laughs> I, I wonder if we could start with you just pronouncing your name correctly as opposed to the incorrect version that you told me to say, but I know it's not quite right. Some people pronounce my last name Tsetsuk. <laughs> <laughs> Some people being my dean, my parents, uh, the judge I clerked for, and a few others. <laughs> mm, well, I, I'm, I apologize for giving the Americanized version, but um, I'll, I'll, I'll try to do better in, <laughs> in the future. So thanks for coming on the show. I thought this was a really cool paper, and I will confess that I'm like a closet administrative law junkie. My friend Emily Bremer kind of planted the bug. And ever since, I haven't been able to excise it. And I thought this was a really uh, cool and provocative look at how agencies work and how they think about what, what they're doing. Uh, but for listeners who might not be so familiar with administrative law, I mean, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about cost-benefit analysis, sort of what it is where it came from, and why it matters in an administrative law context. Sure, sure. So an agency's cost-benefit analysis. So it's essentially an economic analysis that reveals the government's view of what the anticipated impacts of whatever regulatory action the agency is taking is, especially as those impacts compare to alternative approaches that the agency could have taken to address whatever issues trying to address. Um, so these cost benefit analyses have been, well, they're widespread and in fact influential, at least since the Reagan administration, executive agencies have been required to conduct some form of cost benefit analysis for significant regulations and to try to rely on those analyses to inform their decision-making as much as possible. So these cost benefit analyses They'll use models of different impacts. Uh, they'll use data that could inform some of the assumptions in the models. And this data could come from hundreds or even thousands of underlying economic or scientific studies on how different uh, factors are related to each other. Um, so as an example, uh, I start the paper by focusing on, by mentioning the affordable clean energy rule which you might have heard of. This was the Trump administration's replacement for the Obama administration's clean power plan. So that kind of rule, there could be the compliance costs of complying with the rule, and then it might have some benefit. And those benefits would be in the form of uh, greenhouse gas reductions or other air pollutant reductions, et cetera. And so how do we compare that? So the cost benefit analysis tries to quantify both the costs and the benefits and then even further, try to monetize those to the extent possible so that you can end up comparing apples to apples. Uh, how much does it cost to comply with this rule? And what are the expected benefits? Uh, what's the value of those benefits to society at large? Uh, and <laughs> you're the last part of the question, the most important part. Why is this important? I think it's important for holding government agencies accountable to the statutory mandates uh, so we've seen these kinds of rollbacks from the Trump administration. Rollback of the Clean Power Plan is just one example. We've seen fuel economy standards for vehicles. We've seen mercury, uh, mercury limits on power plants. And in all those cases, the cost-benefit analysis played an important role in highlighting uh, potential deficiencies in the agency's reasoning or at least an explanation of what effect these rules might have going forward. Well, so, so, I mean, so I I can't help but wonder, like, what does a cost benefit analysis actually look like? Like, what kinds of things 
the agencies have to consider? Do agencies always have to make decisions on the basis of a cost benefit analysis? And like, to what extent is this kind of analysis like sort of something objective where if you look at it, everyone would agree with the assessment? Or, you know, are there like, is there room for subjectivity or room for difference of opinion in terms of what the analysis actually means? Right. So your first question, what do these look like? So some of these look very technical. They could be hundreds of pages long, um, but all cost benefit analyses have just a few things in common. It forces the agency to sort of uh, think about what the different impacts could be. What are the different costs? Not just the direct costs, but maybe some indirect costs. Maybe it has some kind of a substitution effect that's important. So imagine banning some substance because it might uh, cause some kind of harmful health effects. Well, what happens when you ban it? What are the what are the alternative substances that companies might turn to? Are they worse or better? Uh, so it forces the agency to think about all these impacts, kind of lay them out, list them, and then try to see what kind of information we have on all of these impacts. Also, what is what are the different kinds of substitutes? What are the likely effects uh, changes that might happen in the process? So this all relies on models, so they can become pretty complex. Um, your question about whether it's objective or subjective, that is a extremely important question. I mean, in one sense, it's an empirical question. Uh, doing something will have some effects, uh, but we're, we're looking at this before anything is implemented. So they are, in a sense, just guesses. Like, what, are, what do we think is going to happen, right? Those are incredibly difficult to make. Uh, so we're constantly trying to update our models to make sure that we're making the best predictions possible. So part of, so cost benefit analysis interacts with other things such as regulatory uh, retrospective review, looking back and trying to actually see were we right when we predicted these kinds of effects from this rulemaking. Uh, and so the scientific process improves and over time cost benefit analyses could improve, but the goal is to make sure that the government is acting with both its eyes open when it's working, that it knows what kind of effects are likely so they're to the extent possible, it's not caught off guard with unanticipated uh, negative effects uh, on the economy. So it tries to be objective in that sense. So it relies on these models and tries to improve over time. There is an important aspect of it that's subjective too, or at least um, a little different kind of objective. So I mentioned that to make these even more useful, we often try to monetize impacts. That, that gets tricky. What is the value of uh, re uh, reducing the risk of fatalities or improving health, uh, air quality in this area, et cetera? These are tricky questions and economists have a lot of tools they rely on to make these decisions. Uh, many of them, the best ones I think, re uh, rely on revealed preferences. What kind of decisions are people making? How much are they willing to pay to avoid some risk of death, et cetera? So they use this information to try to quantify how much we as a society would be willing to pay to improve and, and, vary and reduce different kinds of risks. Um, but of course, that's, that's a value component that might change over time, that might change depending on uh, what impacts we're referring to. So that's a little bit, goes a little bit beyond um, objective in some senses, especially if we're not re relying on revealed preference studies. And then some impacts, it's just impossible to really quantify and monetize based on currently available information. So that could, that's the, that, uh, that might be truly subjective. So an agency decision maker would have to look at that and say, you know, I think this is a significant impact. I think this changes the analysis. I think we should move forward because of this. But there's no way to quantify what this means to people or how much we value it. Uh, so then it, it starts to look pretty subjective. But in any event, even in that most subjective scenario, what it does do, the cost benefit analysis, is it at least lays out for the public what are the things that the agency considered or thought uh, were the likely effects and how, what kind of role they played in the agency's decision? Um, mm -hmm. And so I've talked for a long time, but you asked another question. You asked all these great questions at once. <laughs> but um, you also asked me 
how um, how whether agencies always rely on the cost benefit analysis or was is it always influential, right? And that depends. So there is this executive order. The original one was from President Reagan. The one currently in place is from President Clinton. Uh, it does require agencies to conduct these analyses and then rely on them to the extent possible. But, you know, sometimes the statute might prevent the agency from really taking into account some impact. So say the statute says you can't take into cost, cost into account when making this decision. Well, then the cost benefit analysis, it's not going to play a role in deciding what regulatory option to choose. But it still plays a role in at least showing uh, the public what are the likely effects of whatever option that the agency did choose. Mm -hmm. Well, so in your paper, you talk about sort of cost benefit analysis in relation to transparency and kind of the transparency, political transparency of agency action. And you specifically distinguish between what you refer to as process and policy transparency. And I, I wonder if you could kind of explain the difference between those two kinds of transparency and also sort of how you think that they're relevant to thinking about the political salience of alien uh, agency action. Right. So, so Bob and I actually define these two categories because I think they contribute to transparency in different ways. So the first one you mentioned, process transparency, we think of that as transparency about the cost benefit analysis creation. Like who was involved in creating it? Is there a group within the agency? Is it an outside group? Is it available to the public? Uh, when is it available? Is it before the proposed rulemaking? Uh, and what is the role of this analysis in the agency's decision making? And policy transparency is more transparency about the actual inputs and outputs that underlie the CBA's conclusion. So like I said, the CBA is meant to show, uh, reveal what the government thinks is going to happen, the anticipated costs, the anticipated benefits. Well, what are those? What went into making those predictions, et cetera? That would be policy transparency. And we think that they're there's different, you know, part of it has to do with, well, what's the benefit of transparency, right? Um, so transparency could be beneficial because if we look at, if an outside party looks at the cost benefit analysis and just realizes that there's an error, that there, this assumption doesn't make sense or there was uh, an accounting error, um, you know, or there's newer data that's available that actually changes things at the margin, that could be really useful, right? That could improve the quality of the cost benefit analysis. And if that analysis was influential in the agency's decision making, it could even substantively improve agency decision making, it could change what the agency is gonna do going forward. Um, so that's the policy aspect where transparency is important. Um, but then the process one is important too. It doesn't matter. I mean, it matters from trans from just looking at what the impacts are to improve cost benefit analysis. But if it explicitly plays no role in the agency's decision making, then it's never going to move uh, the needle, even if we bring it up. So it could have effects for how much parties might be willing to invest to bring up uh, different deficiencies in the analysis, etc. So they're different in that sense, and and of course. If process transparency is lacking, say the agency never reveals the analysis, then that's going to end up uh, truly diminishing the, per the some of the transparency goals, accountability goals of having the analysis in the first place. Mm -hmm. Well, so among other things, your paper presents an empirical study of different agency cost benefit analyses and how they proceeded, especially in relation to these questions around process and policy transparency. I mean, I wonder if you could just briefly describe the study and what you looked at, sort of how you analyzed it and why you thought this was an important way to think about what agencies are doing. Sure, absolutely. So 
that's one of the important goals of this paper. Uh, we wanted to define these different dimensions of transparency, and then we wanted some way of measuring them objectively in a recent sample with the goal to provide some low-cost recommendations for improving transparency. Uh, I want to take your last question first, because I think it's really important. Uh, the reason we wanted to take a look at the, what is currently, uh, how do these CBAs currently measure up on our dimensions of transparency is because we've heard a lot about transparency in the news uh, lately, especially at, as it relates to agency decision making. So there have been proposals from Congress and even EPA itself and other agencies on increasing regulatory transparency. And these proposals have been really controversial. The focus of the proposals has been on making the raw data from scientific studies publicly available as sometimes a condition uh, before the agency can use that study to inform its regulatory decision making. So what does that mean? So in the abstract, I think we can all agree that transparency in government decision making is a good thing, but it's not an unmitigated good. And these proposals have been transparent, uh, controversial. And Bob and I were just thinking, well, why is that? And I think there was at least two reasons. The first is that that's a really narrow subset of transparency that these proposals are focused on, making all or almost all of the underlying raw data from individual studies that support cost-benefit analysis to be available online. It's sort of a strong arm way of using transparency to improve scientific quality, and it might have significant costs in the meantime if the agency can't rely on the best available evidence because that data was confidential uh, when the scientists first performed it. It's not the only kind of transparency. So opposing this move could reflect a view that the cost of this kind of transparency outweighs its benefits. And again, like I briefly mentioned, there's some concern that this move could discount important epidemiological studies that often rely on confidential medical data, for example. And then the second reason is that, you know, <laughs> It's, it's like cost-benefit analysis in itself. The point of it is to look at the current state of the world uh, and then think about what is the effect of this regulation going forward? How is it going to change uh, outcomes from the status quo? What are the changes on the cost? What are the changes on the benefits? What are the net changes we're going to have from the status quo? And it's sort of similar with transparency. Before we can think about what kind of further transparency to require, we thought it's important to stop and just appreciate or understand what the baseline level of transparency is in cost-benefit analysis now, which is why we wanted to look at a recent sample of cost-benefit analyses. Um, improving transparency is not costless, and without a clear sense, it's, it's hard to think about what the incremental costs and benefits of proposals are. So that's why we thought that this empirical component could be useful to the policy debate that's going on. Mm. Well, I mean, do you think that on some level, it's fair to describe your paper as at least one attempt at a cost-benefit analysis? <laughs> cost -benefit analysis? <laughs> it's, uh, it's providing information that could be used to do a cost-benefit analysis of increased transparency, of proposals to increase transparency and cost-benefit analysis. That's a mouthful. I don't think that the journal editors would have allowed us to make that the title of the paper. <laughs> <laughs> but it, I mean, it, it kind of seems like a, a way to think about what you're trying to accomplish. But also, I mean, it seems like on a meta level, there's a way in which you're complicating the idea of what it means to be transparent for an agency and why we care about transparency and what transparency means in the first place. Uh, absolutely right. Oh, I'm so glad that comes through. That is a big part of what's been motivating us. Um, when you look at these proposals, you can imagine uh, good reasons for them and bad reasons for them. Um, but there's so much low hanging fruit in this area that becomes evident when you actually take a look at these cost benefit analysis. 
uh, analyses. So it almost seems strange to require underlying da raw data from scientific or epidemiological studies to be publicly available when the agency is not oftentimes not even making the models that it uses to generate estimates in its cost benefit analysis publicly available. Or it mm. doesn't let us know what role the cost benefit analysis played in the decision making in the first place. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I mean, I, 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 I will confess that as a sort of notable IP skeptic, I'm, you know, sympathetic to the idea that we should obligate people to make data available, especially when it's data, the collection of which is funded by, by government investment. But I was, you know, I, I, I find the observation compelling that in many of these cases, that's sort of not really what's at stake or, you know, the real transparency problems don't seem to be around the data itself so much as around what the agency is doing with it and why. Right. So, uh, so I, I agree with you. Um, and I, I do want to mention that for data collection, that is, federally funded, that there are often, um, or at least I, I know a few years ago, initiatives were started to try to make that data publicly available to the extent possible. So those efforts are underway. And I also want to mention that within the scientific community, I mean, they're grappling with this. So there are efforts underway to make this data publicly available um, to the extent possible. So it's, it's, uh, it's a movement that's already occurring. So the question is sort of what are the benefits of the government kind of forcing in this way and also conditioning their use of studies in this way? And, and, uh, and that's the jump that we're a little bit more skeptical about. I mean, Bob and I were sort of incrementalists. So we want to look at, well, what are the conditions we'd want in place to make that kind of jump even useful or valuable? Um, and that's why we were looking at, well, what do we already, what kind of transparency is out there with these uh, models and data that's in this cost benefit analysis already uh, before we take that step? And, you know, and it's, let me put it a different way. So it's only valuable, right, to get this raw data from supporting studies uh, now if we at least understand how the agency is using those studies in cost benefit analysis and how much it matters to the decision making. So what I, what I mean is that the first step is to ensure compliance with these basic dimensions of transparency in, in cost benefit analysis, which is one of our recommendation. It would seem strange for an agency to require scientific studies to reveal, you know, information that in some cases might be sensitive or confidential if it's, not revealing the models uh, it uses to make the estimates in its cost benefit analysis. But we've seen that, but we've seen that. So one thing I, I thought I'd mention recently, uh, the EPA, an agency that has proposed relying on raw data from underlying scientific studies to be publicly posted, tried to withhold a core model that it used in its economic analysis. NRDC and EDF, then tried to obtain the model under the Freedom of Information Act, and EPA refused, saying that the analytical model is exempted because it reflects an internal agency uh, deliberation, deliberative process. And recently, the Second Circuit held that the EPA must disclose this model under FOIA. And this is exactly the kind of transparency that, in my view at least, is likely to improve the quality of agency decision-making uh, in a more immediate lower cost way than getting at those underlying studies now, at least before the scientific community has figured out how to uh, do that. Mm. Well, so maybe you could talk a little bit about sort of the results of your study. Like, what did you find uh, about how these process and policy-based transparency elements affect what we know? about agency decision-making in relation to cost-benefit analysis? And what should we do with those results kind of in a forward-thinking fashion 
in relation to kind of thinking about administrative procedure, administrative law, and, and expectations in this area? Right. So, so for our study, we decided to look at uh, cost-benefit analyses performed for sig on significant rules between October 2015 and September uh, 2018. So this was a pool of potential uh, cost-benefit analyses from executive agencies of 167. Now, from those, we decided to look at in detail those that monetize at least some costs and at least some benefits. What this means is if CBAs were mostly qualitative, we sort of eliminated those from our sample. So we focused on the ones that, had, that were most likely to have the sort of transparency that we're trying to get at. Uh, especially that analytical transparency of how did they get those numbers, right? So that left us with 37 cost-benefit analyses from executive agencies. So that already tells you a lot. That means that the vast majority of cost-benefit analyses from executive agencies don't monetize at least some costs and at least some benefits. So they're relying on non-monetized uh, costs or benefits or both in a large number of cases. The independent agencies, they're not required to conduct cost-benefit analysis under the current executive order. They're, to the extent that they perform them, it's, uh, it's usually because their underlying statutory mandates uh, mention considering costs and benefits. So for those, we had an even lower threshold for including them in our analysis, which is does uh, did the agency monetize at least some costs or benefits? Like, was anything mon monetized in this analysis? And we only had 13 from independent agencies that fit that lower criteria. So this means in the vast majority of cases, um, agencies are conducting analysis that does not even get to that monetization point, that they might quantify some impacts um, and they might leave some impacts unmonetized, unquantified, uh, and just qualitative. So that starts to tell you that the value of you know, requiring uh, scientific studies to reveal their underlying data might be low if it's not playing this important role in figuring out the value of these impacts. Uh, process transparency, some good news is that on the executive agency side, at least from the sample we looked at, that was pretty high. Uh, so of the cost benefit analyses that did uh, monetize costs, at least some costs and benefits, they're often in a set, the cost benefit analysis is often in a separate document. It's posted on regulations.gov. Uh, people can access it. It's also usually on the agency website. It's usually available at the time that the proposed rule is available. So any interested party can go check it out as they're evaluating what they think of the proposed rule, um, and it, which I think is good news. Now, where the agencies performed worse was really explaining the relationship between the cost-benefit analysis and the agency's decision-making. And... And that's partly because, you know, economists are performing this. So they might not know the legal or political reasons that an agency has for uh, not relying on the analysis, et cetera. So that's something that's really important, though, for the public to know. Um, so we suggest some ways to improve that and make sure that that discussion is happening somewhere, even if it's not in the cost benefit analysis. Uh, on the policy transparency, so this is that analytical, um, then across the board, agencies performed pretty poorly on those measures. Uh, executive agencies performed much better than independent agencies. And uh, it sort of depends. We limited the sample to those cost-benefit analyses that already provided some monetized costs and benefits. So that obviously is high in our sample, but their discussion of the non-monetized costs and benefits, they list them all, that they explain what role they played in the analysis. Not always, right? Which is surprising. Uh, and then detailed descriptions of models and data were also not always forthcoming. Although at least the executive agencies almost always cited to important studies that they used 
uh, to uh, to inform their estimates. Mm. Well, so Caroline, I mean, I wonder if in closing you could talk a little bit about what you think your findings from this study can tell us about kind of agency law or the kind of the theory of agency law more generally and the role of cost benefit analysis in thinking about what agencies do and why they do it. <laughs> so this reminds me of your question of whether uh, cost benefit analysis is objective or subjective. Uh, so I'm going to give you my subjective view of it, of why I think this is all important uh, and why we need to have more transparency and just a greater understanding of the role of this analysis. Uh, cost benefit analysis is pervasive. It's required by executive order, but even more so, it's increasingly required by courts. Uh, just a few years ago, when Michigan v. EPA came down, uh, sure, there was a dissent, but everyone agreed that the EPA should consider all impacts of its action, costs and the benefits. Uh, so I think uh, more folks are coming on board that, it, it, that it's important for a government agency to try to think ahead of what the likely impacts of its actions are. And cost benefit analysis is better than any other alternative in having a systematic way of approaching that that could be made available to the public. Um, so what role does this play? Well, it's ubiquitous, it's pervasive, so they're already doing it, whether folks like cost-benefit analysis or not. Um, and it's sometimes increasingly a useful tool to, think, uh, to use when thinking about whether in administrative law, a key question is, is the agency's action arbitrary or capricious? Right? Well, one way we can think about whether the decision making was arbitrary and capricious is we want to, State Farm tells us, we can take a look at how uh, the agency decision making compared to the facts on the ground. Was there a logical connection between what we know and what the agency decided to do, what was before the agency? Cost benefit analysis summarizes all of that in one sort of neat document. So it's important. Uh, for us to understand what agencies are doing. It's important for us to understand if they're being arbitrary and capricious. It's important for us to understand uh, the likely impacts of these actions over time. So I think it's, uh, it's an incredibly important part of administrative law that sometimes gets overlooked, probably because if you actually open one of these, <laughs> these things, you probably won't want to read it in just one sitting. Um, but again, but that doesn't mean that it's not an important part of administrative law and agency decision making. Right. Well, Caroline, thanks so much for coming on the show today. This was a lot of fun. I, I learned a lot about CBA and administrative law. And although I know I have a lot more to learn, it's always a pleasure to get a better sense of what's going on. And I really encourage readers to check out your or listeners to check out your paper because um, I liked it a lot. And I think there's a lot of great observations and ideas in there about how we should think about administrative agencies and accountability and relationship to what they do. Brian, thank you so much. <laughs> You are about to hear a sample broadcast of the new North American Van Line series for local agents, tying in with the NAVL-NBC network programs to be heard each weekend on Monitor. <laughs>